Everybody clap. Oh, 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 you make the blind man see. You make the lame man walk again. You cause the dead to rise. And that's why we dance in liberty. Cause you're doing it all. Father to come in for y'all. Just come into your heart, your mind, your spirit, and your life. Blessings upon blessings, you know what I mean? That's what this song is about. Letting God come in into your life and in your spirit and let him just change you. Listen. Mighty warrior great in battle you have overcome My defender no contender, you've already won, and I will lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from, yeah, cause for the Lord is my shield and my fortress, I fear no one, no
Thank y'all for worshiping with us. Y'all may be seated. Enjoy the rest of the service, all right? Hey, you guys. So, I am a student leader here at Youth, and I just want to give y'all a little encouragement for the week. So, as we all know, it is essential that we have a relationship with God, and we seek God, and we prioritize Him in our lives, relationships, and any and everything that we do. He comes first, but are we really doing that? Are we really hearing Him and seeing what He has to say when we go through stuff? As said in John 1 verse 1, God and his word are one. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. With that being said, we try to hear from God audibly and want to actually hear his voice. and want God to give us these signs and signals like, hey, God, you know, if it's really meant to be, then make something happen. That we overlook the power of the Bible, which is his voice and which is his word. People, <laughs> people say read your Bible so you can connect with God and grow in Christ, but most importantly, hear what he has to say so we can further your life teachings and live the right way. Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. When seeking God, you want to remain in him and not just visit him on a Sunday and Wednesday. We as Christians want to remain in him like reading the Bible daily, praying him daily, thanking him daily and praising him in advance daily. You default to what you rehearse the most. So I know a lot of people be like, you know, I have a hard time reading my Bible, but you default to what you rehearse the most. So just read daily and stay consistent. John 15, seven says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask wherever you wish and it will be done for you. Do you notice the pattern? When we receive these blessings, I just think will be given us just for living for God, seeking and prioritizing him and remaining in him. I know a lot of people be like, how do I know if this is for me, if God wanted me to do this? Well, if you remain in him, everything will be given to you. You don't have to sidetrack. Only Jesus can truly satisfy us. He is the bread of life, so you're trying to fill up an empty void of longing you've been filling with sin is only going to go deeper and deeper. Seek God and cast your worries on him because he cares for you. Lastly, when seeking God, we need to live for Christ and not the world. Jesus did not die for us so that we could treat others how they treated him. He also died for you in public, so why are we living for him in private? Let's all truly seek God this week and prioritize him in our lives. Thank you. Welcome to Next Gen Sunday Morning Worship. Welcome. This month, we're hearing from our very own Mr. Isaac and Mr. Ryan on the topic of forgiveness. Who here needs to be forgiven or give forgiveness? This entire month of March, there will be several white bins with I forgive you on them in the comments area. As we journey through this month learning more about forgiveness, we want you all to be praying for someone you need to forgive and ask the Lord to help guide you through the process of forgiving them and forgiving the person that has wronged you. We also want you to write their names on a card or a piece of paper and drop it in the white bins as you enter or exit the building as a way of showing that you're ready to forgive. Remember that forgiving someone does not excuse what they did. It frees you from living under their control. It's time to be free, Next Gen. Okay, let's get into the real in Next Gen. Who's ready for some fun competition? We're having our very own March Madness event on March 26th in gym A and B. If you're interested in the three-point shootout, five-on-five, skills contest, or volleyball game, sign up today. Spots are limited. Oh, and we can't forget to mention the concession stands, giveaways, young adults versus youth basketball game, and a special surprise for our next-gen youth. Make sure you do not miss this. Calling all eighth graders, March 25th, you are headed to shenanigans for some fun. See Ms. Candace or Mr. Ryan for more details. Sign up today to reserve your spot. We have a great opportunity to give back to the community. Our brothers and sisters at Youth World are hosting an Easter basket giveaway on April 8th at 8.30 a.m. And we get to be a part of that. Beginning in March, we're asking all of you to bring a bag of candy and plastic eggs. We will have a bucket outside of the youth room to drop off your items. Next Gen Youth Leaders, on Saturday, March 18th at 10 a.m., we are serving those that are without in this season. We are asking that everyone brings an item or items from their list. The items are toilet paper, deodorant, toothbrushes, toothpaste, hand wipes, sanitizer, lotion, hand towels, and soap. Youth leaders will meet at the church and transportation will be provided. For more information, please see Mr. Isaac. 
Next Gen has added a spiritual growth class for anyone who's interested in growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. This is for you. It's a three week class that begins in March. It's held on first through third Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. April registration is now open. If you would like to sign up, please go to the information desk outside of the youth room. KAA, you know. Are y'all ready for summer camp? We're going back to where it all started. If you enjoy boat riding, treetops, swimming, meeting new people, and so much more, you do not want to miss this year at KAA. For more information, stop by the information desk located outside the youth room. He Scholarship registration for seniors is now open. Seniors, please pick up your application at the Next Gen Youth Information Desk. All HEAT participants and those who are interested in becoming a part of HEAT, please plan to attend the meeting on Sunday, March 18th at 1 p.m. on the first floor youth room. Real Men Discipleship had a great time at Clyde Warren Park, fellowshipping and getting fit for Christ. And guess where they're going next? Fishing. Real men will be headed to Lakeside Park on April 1st, where they will learn how to fish and be fishermen for the kingdom of God. Please see Mr. Ryan for more details. Ladies, Ladylike is headed to Rockwall on April 1st for a brunch and learn picnic style. Come dress in your favorite ladylike outfit and have some fun. Transportation is available. Are you a stepper or enjoy mom and want to join the team? Please stop by the Next Gen Youth Desk to sign up for auditions. Well, that's the real in Next Gen. We hope you all enjoy service. Bye. Bye. Let me make these quick announcements. Heat meeting is immediately after service for you seniors. And all those who are part of the HEAT team, immediately after service, HEAT scholarship deadline is March 31st, okay? March 31st. So make sure you submit that. And if you're interested in a summer job, that's anybody. If you're interested in a summer job, you want to work, make some money this summer, please see Mr. Tarek Jackson for that information. He's usually sitting outside at the desk here, okay? And then lastly, if there's any eighth graders in here that shouldn't be in here, eighth grade fellowship is this Saturday at Shenanigans. Make sure you sign up for that, okay? All right, now for the highlight video. I'll be giving you all the scripture for today, so please stand for the word of God. Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to sell his accounts with his slaves. When he... When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife, his children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him of the debt. But the slave who owed him 100 denarii, but the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii and seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. 
but he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw that what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you of all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And the, his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. You may be seated. All right. Today uh, is going to be heavy, okay? And I, I just want to preface that to you guys as you are reading the scripture. Some of you have, this is your first time reading that, okay? And uh, I want you guys to understand that what I have to say to you today is straight from the word of God, okay? Straight from the word of God. Um, this parable um, Jesus tells uh, to, to Peter because Peter is in this situation where he feels as though he's been hurt so many times and he's experienced so much pain and he's been betrayed so many times. At a certain point, Peter's like, okay, <laughs> that's enough. Right, Lord? Like, that, that should be enough. How many times shall I forgive someone who wrongs me? Seven times? And Jesus says... Not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, you need to forgive your brother as much as I have forgiven you. 70 times seven. Y'all, he's not saying 490 times. After the 491th time, you don't have to forgive your, your brother anymore. That's not what he's saying. He's saying an infinite amount of times. Because after a certain while, if you are living in light of forgiveness, you stop counting. Because your heavenly father does not keep score on you, you don't keep score on someone else. Is that right? In Matthew chapter 7 verse 13, uh, Jesus is talking and he says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many will enter it. Y'all, in other words, what does that mean in layman's terms? Few are forgiven. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many go down that path. But narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and only a few find it. Amen. Amen. Do y'all know what that means? That means if, if we could tell in this room who was forgiven and who was not, we'd be horrified. Because not many of us are. We're not changed by forgiveness. And so a lot of us claim to be Christians, right? But Jesus says, what you say, we'll be able to tell if it bears fruit or not in your life. Amen. Yeah. So it's not you, you just saying that you're a Christian, y'all. Guess what? Everybody believes that they're Christians. I was watching a video and there was a guy named Ray Comfort. Y'all know Ray Comfort in here? Yeah. He went to a jail cell, right? And he's talking to this person. Uh, and he walks up to them and he asks them to articulate the gospel. They can't do it, but yet they're able to claim Christ. And so Ray Comfort walks up to them. He talks about them, the gospel. He shows them their sin. And they still walk away from that conversation, not having understood the gospel, believing that they're Christians, and they cannot articulate the way of salvation. How does that work? He went to a jail cell. He gives the same gospel, y'all, to people who are in prison, people who have murdered people, people who have raped people, people who have molested people, people who have committed armed robbery. Ray Comfort goes up to this person, these people, and he says, do you believe that you're a good person? Guess what their answer was? Yes. Do you believe you're going to heaven? Yeah. yeah. Everybody thinks they're going. Amen. There's nobody in here who has any kind of plans to go to hell. Nobody plans for hell. And yet many, in Matthew 7, Jesus says many go. Amen. So somebody's lying here, and it's not the, our heavenly father. Right. 
It's us. A lot of us bear the name of Christ, y'all. Why? Because it's convenient to do it. If we can pass as Christians, there's some kind of morality that's stamped on you. When you say you're a Christian, it's like, oh, okay, he's a Christian. He's relatively a good person. And that's, that's why so many people name the name of Christ aren't actually, they don't actually recognize what it takes to follow Jesus. They start following him, and then once they recognize what it takes to actually follow him, they fall away. Because they didn't know what they were signing up for. Y'all, that was me. I got baptized three times before I actually gave my, my life to Christ. Three times. Believing that I was okay with God. That I was right with him. Jesus says, you're able to tell that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit not only when your relationship with me is reconciled, but because of your relationship with me, you're reconciled to other people. You, you, you actually forgive people, and people can see it. How many people have you forgiven? Have you forgiven relatively anybody? Have you actually said like, oh, I forgive that person, but then that same person actually shows up in your life and you clench in your jaw? every time you see him. So the clearest test that, that you actually forgive someone is not when you say it, but when they show up. Amen. When the person that's hurt you shows up in your life, oh, I forgive that person, and then they show up. You see him at the mall. Not sure I forgive that person. And you may not say it, but you can't even get close to him. That's what this parable about is today. The title of my sermon is The Unforgiving Heart. Everybody say The Unforgiving Heart. So God asks us to forgive the people that have wronged us, right? No matter what they've done, no matter how much it may cost us, no matter what pain we felt, what kind of affliction they afflicted on us, God says it doesn't matter what kind of hurt it is. You have to transcend the hurt. How do you transcend the hurt? Forgiving them anyway. Loving them anyway. Loving them in spite of how they've hurt you. Because that's how Christ loves you. Not because of what you've done, but in spite of it. In spite of it. No matter how painful it is, no matter what it may cost us, but the times where we know that we should extend mercy and forgive other people. We choose to withhold it instead. So we actually been, as Christians, uh, if you're a Christian in here, then you know the only reason why you're a Christian is because you've been forgiven by God, not because you said so. Uh, you saying you're a Christian literally doesn't give you access to the kingdom. It's what God has to say about you by way of his Holy Spirit. You can't name yourself, y'all. That's not how this works. Have y'all noticed there are people out there in the world that are calling themselves everything? Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. I want to be a man. I want to be a woman. We know what you are. It's not what you call yourself. Does that make sense? Look at Matthew 18, verse 21. Uh, Peter has this misconception about forgiveness. And back in Jewish customs, the reason why Peter is thinking this, not, it's not just because this is just a random thought that Peter is giving. Y'all, he's actually been influenced by, by law more than grace. He's actually been influenced by Jewish customs, which said in that time, after a person has wronged you three times, they're cut off. You, you don't have to forgive them anymore. They get three strikes. It was a three strike rule back in the day and it's funny, we got three strikes now. That's how, that's how we live this life. Up to three times, <laughs> you're done. Y'all, there are people that you have cut off just like Peter. And God said you had no business cutting them off. You had no business treating them as if they cannot be forgiven by you when you're not the judge. I am. That's what God is saying. Right? Matthew 18, 21. He says this. 
Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often? I want y'all to recognize that. How often? In other words, he's keeping count. How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. In Jewish customs, that adds up, y'all, to 490, right? We got any math majors in here? That's, four, that's 490 times, y'all, right? So 435? Uh, no, it's 490, okay? Um, 490 is the numerical value of the biblical Hebrew word tamim. Everybody say tamim. Which means to complete. It's another word that describes perfect. So in other words, how many times should I forgive someone who offends me? Infinite amount. Perfect amount of times. What does that mean for us? We're always forgiving. That's how you're, you're made perfect in God's eyes. When you forgive someone constantly, over and over again. Why? Because you have been forgiven over and over again by God. Does that make sense? And so, y'all, there's never a moment in your life when you actually don't need forgiveness. Never. Most of us actually woke up today not giving God thanks. Sin. You in debt. Automatically, from the moment that you woke up, debt. Not giving thanks, not giving adoration to God. You're acting as if you just breathe life into yourself. Well, we know that's not the case. And so, y'all, why do you always need forgiveness? You're always in debt. Always. That's good. Because Peter, right, experiences hurt, he begins to keep a record of wrongs. Y'all know 1 Corinthians 13, right? Love is patient. Y'all help me out. Love is kind. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It's not proudful. It's not boastful. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not rude. It's not arrogant. But I want y'all to catch something. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. In other words, I want you to replace love with yourself and ask yourself, is this true about me? In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, when it, when it says love keeps no record of wrongs, I want you to insert your name. And then I want you to ask yourself, is this true about me? Do I keep a record of wrongs? Do I file, instead of casting people's sins, as far as the east is from the west, like God does with your sins, when people hurt you, do you cast their sins as far as the east is from the west? In other words, y'all, do you do everything you can to treat them as if you have forgiven them? Or do you keep a record of offenses? Do you file the offenses away? Do you hold on to the anger, the pain? Do you file it? You got a little folder of, of people that have wronged you? You said, man, Mr. Ryan, I don't have a folder. You do. It's in your head. You're keeping a record of wrongs. You're, you're filing a record of offenses that have been committed against you. Y'all see this? What does it say? Yes, yeah, you, right? Okay. I'm going to put you over here. What does it say? God. I'm going to put it over here. Okay. Let me show y'all something real quick. So, that's you. That's Peter. That's all of us who have experienced hurt, pain, vitriol, trial, tribulation by the hands of people. Okay, this is you. This is what Peter does. Instead of filing the record of offenses that have been committed against him and, and, and quitting people of all charges and giving his offenses to God and say, Lord, you know what? I want to take revenge on my enemies, but I'm not going to do it because I know that you did not take revenge on me. And so instead, is this you? Are, you? are you like Peter, where instead of forgiving people for what they've done to you, you just, uh, just file the offenses? Just file them. 
In fact, you got a whole bunch of people that did you wrong. Why don't we just do the whole bucket? Why don't we just put it all in there? I was raped. I was jumped. People were talking about me. People have persecuted me. They said all kind of rude, evil things about me. My dad left. I really don't want a relationship with, any, with him anymore, even though I know he's trying now. And eventually, you get to the point where it overflows, okay? You get to a point where because you have held on to anger, you're overflowing and you're about to burst. Some of in you in here are very, very angry. You're angry because of what was done to you. You're angry because of what happened to you. And y'all, instead of, instead of releasing people from what they've done, y'all, you've done the opposite. You've done what Peter's done. He's actually keeping a record of wrongs now. But y'all, keeping a record of wrongs never hurt God. It always hurts you. Y'all, you can't hurt him. He's the creator of the universe. He doesn't desire that you should sin against him. Why? Because it hurts you. <laughs> it hurts you. And, and this, is, this is where we have to cor correct our theology because a lot of us think that God needs us. He doesn't need you. He just wants to be with you. He doesn't need you guys at all. He doesn't need me. It says in Isaiah that God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. And so many of us actually believe we're like the unmerciful king. We don't really believe that we owe God. We believe that God owes us. That's our mentality. That's how we think. You walk out of here thinking that God just had to have you at church today. You're not doing him a favor by being here. He does not need you. I heard somebody say, man, God is just wringing his hands, begging that you come to him. No. God desires that you should be with him. Amen. But he doesn't need you. You need him. Amen. This is how you survive, guys. You didn't create yourself. Self-made. Okay. <laughs> it's ironic that we're self-made, but we actually need people to get to where we want to go. Amen. You're not self-made. You didn't make yourself. God made you. How do we know that God made us? It's because if we think we're self-made, if we think that we can control things. Y'all, have you ever noticed that the biggest event of our lifetime we cannot control? That's our death. You can't control that. Y'all, every day people are passing away. And these are some people who believe that they were self-made. No, you're not. Y'all, God is pulling people down and into judgment. That's what's happening. That's what death is. You ever notice how when people get older, they start to get lower to the earth? Their back is kind of hunched over now. God is going to require your life. We were made from dust. You get lower as you continue to live this life. Because the inevitable has to take place because of your sin. You got an appointment with him. And what condition is he going to find you in? Right? Peter starts to put all of his record of wrongs in a bucket. And so because he's starting to file the record of offenses done to him, he loses the sight of God's forgiveness. He loses sight of grace. So y'all, if you're worried about what other people have done, y'all, most of the time, the people that have actually hurt us, they're not worried about us anymore. They actually go on living their life. And y'all, if you really want someone to feel your pain, your sorrow, forgive them. Why? Because if you don't, you're becoming just like them. You're becoming exactly like them. And that's the devil's plan, to mold you, to shape you into his image. Y'all, the devil is angry. 
So what is his job? To make you angry. But guess what, y'all? The devil is still angry. So what does that mean? He wants you to always be angry, just like him. Angry forever. Have you ever thought about that? The devil is not a happy person. So if, if you've never been happy in your life, I want you to consider it could possibly be because I don't belong to God. I may not know him. Why, y'all? Because Jesus says, for the joy that was set before him, he adored the cross. Y'all, even when he was going through suffering, he had joy in his heart. Why? Because his joy did not come from this world. It didn't come from what happens to him. It's because in spite of his disapproval from man, he's been received by God. That's why he's able to have joy in his heart. Does that make sense? Point number one, there are three points for you. The reasons why we don't extend mercy to other people after we were just forgiven, right? So the unmerciful king, the unmerciful servant goes to this king and recognizes that he's in debt. And I just want to paint some historical context for you, y'all. He owes the king an insurable amount of money insurmountable. He cannot pay it. It's like you owing Bill Gates. You got what it takes to pay Bill Gates? What kind of job you working? Working at Chick-fil-A. You can't pay that. <laughs> Dude, what's wrong with Chick-fil-A, bro? Nothing. <laughs> A fool with Chick-fil-A, man. They never forget my sauces. Honey roasted barbecue, please. Number two, spicy deluxe, high seafood punch. <laughs> I know y'all feeling me right now. Yo, I had people, somebody, I got to tell y'all this, I had somebody at Chick-fil-A, uh, I was getting some, <laughs> I was getting some food for my wife, right? Told him I wanted all the sauces in the bag, right? So I look up and wow, to my surprise, none of my honey roasted barbecue, none of my ranch, none of my, uh, what's the other sauce, the sweet and sour sauce? Polynesian, oh Jesus, oh, my God, Polynesian, right? So what happens, I had to tell y'all this real quick, uh, God forgets all of my sauce in the bag. So I'm driving off low key disappointed. And y'all, I look in the rear view mirror. <laughs> He's like, uh, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, got all your sauces in the bag. Honey roasted barbecue, Polynesian, Chick-fil-A, uh, barbecue, put a little ketchup in there. You didn't ask for that, but uh, my pleasure. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about, dog. I love you. My Christian brother, can we give it up for Chick-fil-A in here? Doggone it. Y'all go to Popeye's, you're not going to get that kind of service. So can I help you, sir? I'm like, hello, can I get it? Would that be all? I didn't even tell you my order yet. And the food be tasting so good. The disrespect is so high. But that chicken is so hot. The disrespect seasons the chicken. Yes. That's the ingredient. Disrespect. So... We're going to go there after church over, okay? <laughs> I couldn't. Y'all know I got to get mine in. We don't understand how much sin costs, and that's the reason why we don't forgive others. Matthew 18, 26. Y'all look at verse 26. It says this. It says this. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. And I want y'all to notice something. Look at the latter half of that verse. Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Wait a minute. It says that this man owed 10,000 talents. I want you guys to understand something. One talent equals 20 years worth of wages. One talent. 10,000 talents times 20. What's that? 200,000. In other words, what? This man can never pay the king back. So what is he talking about? I will pay you back everything. How are you going to pay back 200,000 years worth of wages back to the king? How are you going to do that? Bro, you only got 73 years, maybe. 
That leaves you at 199,727 more years worth of wages. I will pay you back everything. You know what I think? I think he's lying. Yeah. I think he's lying. I think the king knows it, and I think he knows it. They know exactly how much he has to pay. He can't pay it. But he tells the king, yet and still, I will pay you back everything. Y'all, this is equivalent to this. Y'all ever been in a situation where you're in a spot, you in a jam, and you say one thing, and I think y'all know what I'm about to say. Lord, if you get me out of this situation, oh gosh, I promise I'll never do it again. We don't even say I'll never do it again. Some of us do. Most of us go the extra mile, and we say, I swear. I swear, even though the king knows and you know that you can't, you you can't live up to what you just said. You ever been in that situation? You literally said, sorry, I won't do it again. The reasons why this unmerciful servant says that is because he's just trying to get off. The situation in and of itself is enough for him to swear, but it's not enough for him to keep his word. It's enough for him to say, man, I want to get out of this situation so bad. Lord, I need you right now. But the situation doesn't change his horizontal relationship with other people. It it, it doesn't change him. The circumstance changed because of the grace of the king, but he doesn't change. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that this king would know that this servant would not forgive and he chose to forgive him anyway? Yeah. That's many of you in here. You believe that you're actually in cahoots with God, you got a strong relationship. Why? Because he's let you off. It's not because you actually have a right relationship with God. It's because by his grace, this is who he is naturally. Y'all, in Matthew 5.45, it says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. In other words, what? Evil people get God's grace. Even if they don't belong to him. That's what that means. And so the unmerciful servant is a little bit confused. But I also think he just wants to get off. He's sorry for what the situation costs him. But he's not sorry for what the situation costs the unmerciful king. In other words, what? He expresses what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, worldly grief. Worldly grief, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, produces death that leads to destruction. Godly grief produces life and repentance that actually leads to change. Which one does the unmerciful servant show? Worldly grief or godly grief? Worldly grief. He's sorry, not because he loves the king, not because he's living in light of grace now, He's sorry because of what it cost him. Y'all, ladies, that's why many of the dudes that you're actually dating don't change. Because once you caught them, red-handed. Everybody say red-handed. And she's like, mm, red-handed. <laughs> red-handed. That's why your parents actually bust through the door. Why do they always bust through the door when they're trying to catch us doing something? <laughs> she doing in here? Why? why? What's the hostility about? (laughs) Trying to catch you, (laughs) right? But there's some moments, right? Your mom tells you to clean the room. I'm going out with your father. I'm going out with your daddy. Clean the room. This house better be clean before I get back. This better be put up. That closet better be clean. And guess what, fellas? This is what you were doing. You kept playing 2K. All right, mama. As soon as you hear that garage door open. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. 
Come on, bro, help me. Nah, bro, this, you chose this. Well, your, your, your sister, your sibling, I ain't helping you clean that up, it's you, right? And what you do, instead of actually folding all your clothes, because you don't have time for that, you throw them in the closet. Ah, and then she, you're too late. She's already walking up the stairs. Uh-huh, turn around, you got about four or five licks. I know that's happened to y'all, though. That's like the scariest sound when you hear that garage door opening. And but you and your brother look at it like, oh, please. And she gonna be so unmerciful on that behind. Ah! My mom was unmerciful. She striked me. I love you, mom. <laughs> Instead of Peter throwing away the debt of his debtors, he keeps his debtors in debt to him. In other words, what? He becomes the judge. He becomes the ruler. He becomes the master. That's some of you in here. I know that you've been hurt. I know that you've been wronged. If you're anything like me, y'all, it's human. We get hurt all the time. But y'all, God never told you to collect. He said, leave it to me to collect. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, not you. Y'all, because when you try to inflict vengeance on someone else, you know what happens? Vengeance inflicts itself on you. That's how it works. Some of y'all are literally trying to make your offenders feel you because they've wronged you, because you're hurt, you're very, very angry, and I get it. So many things have happened to me, y'all, and I don't want to let it go. I really don't. Be honest with you. I recognize what started happening to me. David, when he sins against God in Psalms, he says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. In other words, if David has a right relationship with God, God is not going to make him right until he forgives. It says God laid his hand on David because you know that's not how we get down in the kingdom, David. And so until you forgive, y'all, David pins Psalms 51 after he sinned. Y'all know what David did? Had his homeboy killed on the front lines and married his homeboy's wife. Uriah. And yet, and yet, couldn't fathom this, and yet, God calls David a man after his own heart. How is that? In so many words, he forced Bathsheba to get with him. Some people, some theologians, they said he, he, he might have raped this woman. And yet, at the same time, it says that he's a man after God's own heart. Well, how is that possible? Forgiveness has no limits. It does not matter who did it, what happened. God does not have a qualifier like we do. We like to look on Fox News, see people that have arrested, see people that have gotten murdered, and we say, that person cannot be forgiven, they're disqualified. That's called cancel culture, right? How many people have you canceled? And God hadn't canceled them yet, but you have. But guess what? When it's judgment day, right, and it's time to see God, you're going to watch your offender get in before you. And that's going to crush you. Why? Because he got to a point where he recognized, I'm a sinner. And all this debt that I owe God, I can't pay back. I'll never be able to pay it back. Unlike the unmerciful servant who believes somehow you're going to be able to work and then get forgiven. Y'all, if you want to work, if you're trying to work your way to get to God, if you're doing like a lot of religious activity in order to be approved by God, you don't want a relationship with him. You want to control him. As long as I'm praying, as long as I'm fasting, you're like the Pharisees. As long as I'm doing this, as long as I'm going to church, as long as I show up for 18 years, to next gen, I'm good. Nah, you're not good. You think you're good. And on top of that, you're hanging around people that tell you that you're good, even though you're not. That's why many of us go to church for 18 years, and then when we get to college, we don't go to church for five. 
because we actually don't have a relationship with God. And guess who did that? Mr. Ryan. Ain't it crazy? Oh, I know Jesus. Y'all gonna trip when y'all hear this. My mom and dad raised me in a Christian home. Believed I knew God, right? Affirmed me just as they should. Love my mom and daddy for that. Right? They trained me in the way that they should go. They did the best that they could. But y'all, just because your parents train you in the way that you should go does not mean you're automatically indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's not what that means. Right? My parents wanted to know God for me. <laughs> they couldn't. But I played along. I got to be honest, that's what some of y'all are doing. You're just playing along. I got to be here. I get it. But y'all, if you knew how much debt you owed, you would recognize it's not my parents who just need forgiveness. It's not just my homegirls or homeboys that need forgiveness. I personally am in debt. And I don't have, I don't have any money to pay him back. Y'all, because you have robbed an eternal God. Is 73, 73 years worth of sin really worth me being separated from God from all eternity? Yes, because it's not what you borrowed. It's who you borrowed from. You borrowed from an eternal God. Y'all, that is why the unmerciful servant, his, his debt is so large. Why? Why is it so big? It's because the king is trying to get him to understand. No matter how, how many people in this world offend you, they offend me more. They hurt me more. They spit on me as much as they spit on you, as much as they talk about you when you walk down the hallway. They talked about me. And guess who else talked about me? You. We're all in debt. Right? And so, y'all, that's why God, he didn't just die for all of us. He died for each yeah. of us. Right. Yeah. You can have a personal. That's why your parents can have a relationship with him. But guess what? Your relationship with him, with him can be just as real and just as vibrant yeah. and just as effectual. It's because he's a personal God. Right? He didn't yoke us together. We didn't all come out the same womb. Oh, but yes, we did. We came from his womb. We didn't get out of the womb Siamese twins. We weren't joined at the hip. Y'all, personal, personal relationship. And this unmerciful king, he can't see that. He can't see it. What will happen to you if you do not take God's forgiveness to heart? Some of you in here are just like uh, the unmerciful servant. If you're like me in my past, right? Some of you are having a really hard time with your parents right now. Hard time. And you're so proud. You're so haughty. You're so diligent in disobeying them. Right? And you cannot see this is exactly the devil's plan for him to sow discord in your own family. He wants you to turn on your own kind. Be somebody like Judas. Somebody like that. Somebody that you're close with, close proximity. I don't want to be with them. I don't want a relationship with them. Some of you believe in here, and I want you to understand, this is literally the most disrespectful thing you can ever say to your parents. I'm going to pay you back. Disrespectful. Why? Because you assume that money is what they want from you when all they want is respect. Amen. They want you to love them. They want you to be patient with them. They want you to understand that they do mess up sometimes. Y'all, they're sinners. Amen. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to mess up. They're going to get it wrong. But nothing makes a mother cry and a father cry then when he sees or she sees their son, their daughter in rebellion to them, choosing the same things that they chose, that hurts. I got a daughter now. That might happen. That might hurt me. I want to protect her from that. Some of you think you could pay your parents back. I'll pay you back. 
you know, when I turn 19, 20, when I get out on my own, mama pay you back. <laughs> pay me back. That's an instrumental amount of debt that you can't pay. Y'all, they put a roof over your head for 18 years. Not only that, they went to school. They went to a job and they worked so they could, they could cover you for 18 years. Y'all, in other words, what? If your parents stop working, you don't eat. It's grace. That's grace. You got to rest in that. Can't pay your parents back for what they've done for you. And in the same way, you can't pay your parents back for what they've done for you. You cannot possibly pay Jesus back for what he did on the cross. What is your plan when you see God face to face? What are you going to say? I heard somebody say, man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell God, I said, stop right there. (laughs) You're not going to say anything. Your mouth will be closed. You're going to be like Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. Guess what? By that time, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. So what will happen to you if you do not take God's forgiveness to heart? You will not be changed. If you if if the forgiveness that God gives you does not change you, y'all, you will not be changed. You won't be changed. Look at verse 25 through 28. Wrapping up here. And it says, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant, the same one. When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Y'all, that word found means that he actually diligently went and searched him out after he got forgiven, after he left the presence of the king. So you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that as he's being forgiven, he has unforgiveness on his mind. Why? Because the moment that he leaves the presence of the king, he goes, he doesn't stumble upon this man that owes him money. He seeks him out. Is that what you're doing? Are you seeking people out who you think owe you? And I get it, y'all. You've been hurt. You've been offended. It's some tragic things, y'all. Traumatic things even that's happened to you. But are you putting people in debt? is your desire to control them. And I want you to understand something about us sinners. Y'all, we have very warped desires. Meaning that like after someone has offended us and hurt us, we actually somehow draw up some kind of advantage. And we say, I can put them in debt. You see how much they're on their knees for me. Instead of forgiving them, instead of dealing with the hurt and anger, going to see a therapist, whatever it is, giving it to God, dealing with it, you make them deal with it. You put them in debt. Just like Peter. You will not be changed. You will get angry. Do we have that slide? I want to put that up if they uh, can see that. Look at this. That's what I want to do to Popeye sometimes. Where is my sauce? You're going to be like this guy, and you're going to get angry. You're going to get angry. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26, it says, Be angry, do not sin. Y'all, wait a minute. There are people out here who believe that Christians are emotionless creatures. 
We can't feel. And your God don't want us to have no kind of feelings, bro. Like if I cry, he gonna say something. Where you get that at? Jesus wept. <laughs> Do your research instead of repeating something that's actually not true. Be angry and do not sin. Y'all, in other words, sin obviously means transgression of the law, but sin means that you take control of what is actually God's. That you actually desire to possess something that's not yours. Be angry. Feel it. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, grieve, but not as those who have no hope. In other words, y'all, he's telling us to grieve. He's telling us to feel. Feel it all. Don't sit in the judgment seat. That is where you begin to sin. Does that make sense? That's where you start to sin. You start to sit in that seat and you start to believe that, you know what? I'm starting to file these record of offenses. I'm going to keep them in debt to me. In other words, what? I'm going to control them. That word in verse 28 says he seized him. In the Greek, that that word is krateo. Everybody say krateo. Which means, check this out, to become master of, to obtain, or to get into one's power. Oh, so this is what he wants to do. He wants the person who does not forgive, the person that doesn't allow God's forgiveness to change them, They got something else in store. They want to get the person that offended them into their power and control them and to master them. But let me tell you something. If you have refused to forgive someone, y'all hear me, it's because you desire to be in control. But when you are in control, you actually lose control. No wonder. And you guys, some of us get hurt in here and we feel it. Some of us more than others. And instead of giving it to God, that's why you're so stressed out. That's why you're so anxious. That's why you're so bitter. It's because you haven't let it go. And guess what? You haven't let them go. So you're like living with two people. (laughs) It's you and your offender. It's only just meant to be you and God. You can't carry that weight. So that's why some of you are being crushed under the weight of unforgiveness because you're keeping them in debt to you. And if you're anything like Peter or myself in the past, y'all, it's going to take just but a moment, just but a situation to happen to where you turn into this guy. You're going to seize them. You're going to control them. Y'all know people in here uh, that have gotten jumped. I know people in here that um, have gotten picked on. And you know when I'm actually the most scared for them is when they pretend like it didn't happen. And they store it up inside. Oh, I'm good, Mr. Ryan. I'm straight. Like, you know, bro, they, you bleeding, dog. Like, you good? No, I'm good. Like, bro, it's okay to, like, be angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm straight. He's doing something else. He's storing those offenses. Can't tell. But in here you can, and his bones are wasting away. Y'all, that's why people commit suicide and they go quietly. Because they're being destroyed from the inside. You will get angry, and then God will get angry. That's the close. Verse 34, look at that. And in anger, his master delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all his debt. Wait a minute. This guy holds 200,000 years worth of wages. How is he going to pay all his debt? The scripture's a paradox. He can't. But he thinks he can. He's never going to get out. And some of you are Christians in here. And this would also apply to you. Because you actually belong to the Holy Spirit, your life's just going to be miserable. You're still going to heaven. Your life's going to be miserable here on earth. So in that sense, you won't get out either. 
But the person that's an unbeliever, the person that does not allow the Holy Spirit to change them from the inside out. In the same way, when that person gets thrown away, he's never going to be able to pay that back. God will hand us over to the torturers. The debt that was owed, the unmerciful servant couldn't pay. And instead of forgiving the one who wronged him, he stores all of the offenses done to him. So what can we do? Forgive and release others from what they've done. That's what you can do. If you do not release others from what they owe you, then Jesus will not release you from what you owe him. But if you forgive people, everybody know the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Pause. Pause. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Other words, they're synonymous. Your trespasses can be forgiven because you were forgiven by God. So you should also forgive others for what they've done to you. So Jesus in the parable, he's not making light, y'all, of what happens to us. He's not making light of what happens to Peter. He's not making light of what happens to you. He's not telling you you can't feel the hurt, the pain, the rage. He's not telling you that. But he's telling us whatever that was done to us is relatively small compared to what we've done to him. It's relatively small. Whatever the amount that people owe you, I just want you to know you owe God way more. Way more. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you that while we were still yet sinners, while we were still in debt to you, you died for us. Lord, it says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, what? He who had no debt became debt so that our debt might get canceled. with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you desire for your debt to be canceled and you know your anger has went beyond anger, you're beginning to sin against God because you're keeping a record of wrongs. You're storing up offenses. And in your life, you feel like you're about to burst and you need God's forgiveness the reasons why you are so weighed down and so anxious is because God has not released you and you have not released others. So if there's anyone on the sound of my voice that desires to be released from the pain, from the anger, from the vitriol, from the tribulation that we've experienced, if you are tired of holding on to that, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. That's good. So our kingdom servants, you guys see hands raised. I want you to grab them and take them over there. That's good. That's good. We got one right here. Right here. Yeah. If you say... Mr. Ryan, I have taken God's forgiveness into my heart. I am born again. I do know Jesus. And I know that to be true because I have peace in my heart. But Mr. Ryan, something has happened. Someone has offended me. Someone's hurt me. And I desire to get them back. Even though I know my Lord says vengeance is mine, I will repay. And I'm out of alignment with God. And I I need to restructure. I need to realign myself with God. That's you and you know Jesus. But you know that there's some, some stuff that you need to forgive. I want you to raise your hand. 
you know Christ, if you know that my Redeemer lives, I belong to Jesus, I belong to Christ, by grace am I saved, but I'm not acting saved. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that you have cleansed us from all of our debt, Lord, all of our sins. Lord, if we belong to you, then we know that we can humbly and boldly approach the throne because we have been forgiven. So there is no hesitation for us approaching you. We know that we can because our hearts, our spirits testify to the truth. We have integrity in our hearts. We just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for these students. We thank you that in spite of what's happened to us, Lord, as painful as it may be, we have the power by way of your Holy Spirit to forgive people anyway because we know that you have forgiven us. These are all the blessings I ask in your son's name. We pray, amen. Well, hello, and thank you for tuning in to our Next Level Youth online services. My name is Isaac Shepard. You can find more youth content on our Facebook and Instagram at Next Level Youth W3. Also, don't forget to tune in to Dr. Tony Evans every Sunday at 11 a.m. on our OCBF Church, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you, and God bless you.